<laughs> Welcome back to Radical Thursdays. On this episode, we had the privilege to talk to Jordan from Feast Down East. You might remember this organization being mentioned in one of our earlier episodes with Boot Scrap. They truly are an amazing organization, and we are excited for you to hear it. On this episode, we talked about how one of their longest members, Jordan, became a part of the organization, ways that FDE is impacting lives around their North Carolina town and their exciting upcoming projects. Thank you to Jordan for giving us the opportunity to learn about the work that Feast Down East does, and we hope you enjoy this episode. Um, first of all, thank you for joining us. We're so glad you could um, come and talk about a little bit how who you are and kind of your involvement in Feast Down East. Um, so could you tell us a little about yourself, your condensed life story kind of thing? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Thanks for having me first and foremost and, you know, highlighting these important issues in our local community, but also, you know, er other areas of the world and country, because we know that this is <laughs> something that your facial expressions are the best. <laughs> uh, All the time. <laughs> uh, but these are topics that are really important for us to talk about. So thanks for having me. And Shout out to Bootstrap for connecting us. I love that. Um, but so my name is Jordan Appel Hughes. I wear quite a few hats. I'm the locomotive program director for Feast Down East. Have my own farm, Green Sky Farms. I live in Yamacraw, which is in Pender County. Um, so if there is a little bit of a lag, I'm sorry. Um, rural internet life. Um, I'm not a North Carolina native. I am Michigan grown. So I lived in Michigan until I was 23 and moved here in 2015. So I'm putting down roots in North Carolina now, which is great. I have really loved being here. Um, but, you know, before I came to North Carolina, um, growing up, I was always really passionate about the environment and, you know, having stewardship for the environment, both as individuals and families, but also for our wider community. I, my uncle's best friend saw me right before I moved here and he lives in San Francisco. And he, when I told him what I was, you know, doing with my life, he was like, I don't know if you remember this, but when you were three, and visiting California, we were driving down the interstate and I threw trash out the window and you made us turn around and made me go pick up my trash and then another stretch of litter. Um, so I've always been like this and, you know, always have been, you know, trying to educate others and kind of, you know, hold ourselves accountable for our place on this earth and within our communities. Um, you know, that passion followed me through high school. When I was in high school, I was the president of the club, which the stood for the tree hugging environmentalist. Um, so <laughs> that was great fun. Um, and our faculty teacher lead for the club, um, her name is Dr. Marks, and she actually started beekeeping at her first at her house and, you know, asked me if I would be interested in, you know, learning more about beekeeping and bees and all that good stuff. And I was like, heck yeah. And so as we were like, you know, building that out, our local district, like outdoor education center was talking to her about installing apiaries. So I actually got to help her install an apiary lead educational lessons at the outdoor education center for mainly with first and second graders and you know from there that kind of like sparked my interest in like farming and food but really more at like let's you know provide ecological spaces that are natural for our native pollinators um and being from michigan water was a huge issue for me. 20% um, of the world's fresh water is found in Michigan. So that, you know, that's something we really need to ensure that we're not poisoning and preserving because as we know, there's very little 
potable, safe drinking water provided for the whole world. Um, and got started getting involved in anti-fracking campaigns and, you know, went to some different summits, both in Michigan, in Ohio, Pennsylvania, and DC. And when I went to college in 2000, I was in university from 2010 to 2014, I brought a lot of that experience with me and found a program through, I was in the anthropology program, um, that was my major. And my minor was environmental studies and sustainability. And there was a study abroad trip that went to New Zealand looking at sustainable living methods and agriculture and farming and you know food systems. And I was like, heck yes, take me to New Zealand. Um, so I went to New Zealand the spring summer of 2012 and it was incredible. I actually tried to get some of the farmers from the farm I was living on to throw my passport into the bush so I could just be there forever. They didn't do that. Kind of glad they didn't. Um, but when I was in New Zealand, you know, New Zealand as an island, they are super isolated, you know, resources, you really have to manage correctly and ethically and holistically. Um, so, you know, we talked about sewage and water, like, you know, for instance, in a lot of areas of the United States, you can't collect rainwater and some places you can't even use it for your gardens or you can't, you know, drink it. Um, it's illegal, like you can get like fined and ticketed for it in a lot of places, but in New Zealand, they actually encourage it. And it was really like interesting getting to see like how they were approaching these like issues and policies in contrast to what we were doing here in the States. And part of the trip had us living in um, a community agriculture space. So, you know, they, you lived on the farm, you worked on the farm, every like aspect, you know, was intrinsic to each other. So, you know, every morning you started out the day with a community meeting with all of the tasks at hand, you know, ranging from preserving to weeding, to pruning, to working the market stand, to filling gravel in the driveway. Um, and it, you know, was a true community in that regard. And, you know, and seeing how this, you know, agricultural community, which is called Wilderland. They're still there. They're in the Cormadal Handle. If you ever make your way to New Zealand and want to go stay in an organic farming community, it's the one. It's truly magical. But part of that magic was just seeing how, you know, the interdisciplinariness between all of these issues and how they're really layered into one another. And for me, that's when, you know, natural resource management, water preservation, you know, creating environments for our native pollinators and species and, you know, providing like access to those things and those resources and that knowledge to people who, you know, and not just like people like me who had the privilege of being able to have these different types of experiences, but making that information resource skill available to everyone and that's when it all like all the like you know like little wheels and the clockwork aligned for me and i was like okay like agriculture that's that's it that's what i'm going to pursue so i was originally primatology emphasis i wanted to work with like endangered you know um monkeys and chimpanzees and orangutans and like fun things like that. And I shifted to focusing on food systems, agriculture within my studies in anthro. Um, and, you know, I really found a lot of joy when I returned to the States working on the sustainable agriculture project, which was our student run farm at Grand Valley, I went to Grand Valley State University. I feel like this is the map of Michigan of the lower peninsula, and then you have the upper peninsula, and Grand Valley is like right about here. So that's that's where I went to school. Um, that's where the farm was, and I found a lot of joy, you know, getting 
to talk to folks. I managed our farm. We had a little farm stand on campus and I managed that and got to talk to folk about, you know, what we were growing, how we grew it, what we were doing and was able to lead some like workshops on the farm and, you know, just found a, I felt really good about educating folks about all this and, you know, just talking to them. So when I graduated, I found this before I graduated, I, we, I had found out about this really cool AmeriCorps program called Food Corps, which basically teach, teaches kids how to grow healthy food and cook it in really fun ways. And then like, you know, everything kind of in between behind, you know, growing food and eating it and cooking it and, you know, like looking at like, okay, so like, how does a fruit form or like what a fruit even is, you know, like, still blows people's minds that, you know, like peppers and tomatoes, they're technically fruits, which, you know, we always just refer to them as vegetables. So just talking about those different things, but I didn't think I was qualified enough for food core. So I was like, okay, I'm going to wait a year. I'm going to find another AmeriCorps program here in Michigan and do that for a year and then try to try to get in the food core. So I did a year of AmeriCorps VISTA and there's different tiers to AmeriCorps. There's the VISTA program, which is the oldest running program. Um, Kennedy put it in place. There's a senior core program um, and there's state national programs. So Food Corps falls under a state national. VISTA is a separate wing. And as a VISTA, I was a service learning coordinator and basically worked with schools and teachers and designing programs where they would be taking the curriculum that they were teaching in school and applying that to, you know, volunteering in their community and, you know, doing acts of service. And so I was able to build a school garden while doing that, develop, you know, like partnerships between agencies and farms and organizations and, you know, different area schools, because I worked in a really big region. Um, where I went to school, the city, Grand Rapids, it's kind of like Wilmington. It's, you know, a big, small city, and then everything surrounding it, like there's no suburbs. It's just, you know, Grand Rapids and then farms. So kind of similar in that way. So we were able to make those connections. After I did that, fortunately, I got in the food core. Um, I applied to serve in the state of North Carolina as my first choice, and mainly because my dad moved to South Carolina when I was in high school, so I wanted to be closer to him, and got accepted. It was, you know, a dream come true. I was, you know, with Food Corps, you're just randomly placed with a site. Um, you get to interview with the few, like, you know, as many sites who want to interview you, and then you're assigned to one of those sites that you interview with. So I, that's how I ended up with Beast Down East and Wilmington was all because of Food Corps. Um, so I came here August of 2015. I, I served with Food Corps for two years through Beast Down East. I was based in New Hanover County Schools. Um, we did have Food Corps in Brunswick County as well. Um, for the past few years, the cooperative extension has been facilitating the Brunswick County programming and not Beast Down East. And unfortunately, I don't really know if this is public knowledge, but I don't really care. Um, Food Corps is no longer going to be in North Carolina after the service term ends in July. And the reasoning to me is I, I'm, I just want to say some choice words that I'm not going to choose to say, but they want to focus on states and regions that have a history of systemic racism and inequity around food, which uh, is North Carolina, like to a gonna say, is that not North Carolina? It's like, did they not? <laughs> okay. <laughs> is it? So is it, I like, uh, when I got the email, I was just like, you like you so where are they going if they're not south so carolina they're pulling out of north carolina and they're pulling out of new york city they pulled out of arizona which for indigenous um yeah. folk is like 
you know, and, you know, with people coming over, people like, you know, getting to leave a really bad situation in their home country, like, that's kind of like a central state for that. So, like, I'm like, why? But okay, like, all right, I guess that's what you're doing. But they're still in Michigan and Detroit, which thank I'm really happy about that. If it would have pulled out of um, that area, it would have been a little peeved. They're still in Oregon. They're still in California. In the southern region, I know they're still in Arkansas and Mississippi, but I believe those are the only two southern states now. Hmm. That's yeah. so weird. <laughs> Interesting yeah. choices of states. Because <laughs> usually, Interesting. and to only those... be like in two, like only those two, like southern states, when you have like a lot more like you have Georgia, Louisiana to not be in any of those or like Florida. Yeah, you would think they Bama. would go Louisiana because of New Orleans and the disaster that they experience and kind of the food desert that they're in. In New York, I mean, so many people live in the city and finding food in the city is hard enough. Although that's, community that's so... community groups in New York have been uh cuz I follow a lot of the food justice tags just to see what everyone else around the country is doing. And I've seen a lot of community leaders and groups in uh, New York City do the new food fridges, which are really intriguing. I kind of want to get one of those. Those are so here. cool. But so that may be why. But still, hey, it's probably because of funding. And that's the reasoning they gave. But that's kind of a poor re- reasoning when <laughs> yeah. North Carolina was literally. <laughs> you know, and funding is totally like a big piece to it. Um, I think funding and also, you know, current legislation when I was in food court my second year, I always like to say I left one crappy governor for the next. When I left Michigan, Governor Snyder, who is the one responsible for covering up the Flint water crisis. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that guy, he was not so great. So moved away from him to be governed by McCurry. Um, so, you know, HB2 passed in 2016. And Food Corps was actually like very, North Carolina was one of like the foundational sites for Food Corps. And, you know, in, in Feast Down East was huge at that. Um, James Steigerwald and Leslie Hosfeld, who... Um, Leslie's in Clemson and Jane unfortunately passed away right after Hurricane Florence in 2018, but they were, you know, really imperative in bringing the food core program to North Carolina, but, um, and like our mid-year gathering for 2016, 2017 was supposed to be in the triangle and they almost, um, they did change it. I think it was, no, it was an Athens year before they did, they, didn't end up they changing the location, but they spoke about changing it because there were so many service members who were uncomfortable coming to a state. You know, some of them were trans and and still are. So, you know, coming to a state where, you know, you can't feel safe, like going to the restroom, like that's that's a problem. Like yeah. that's a problem that like one shouldn't even exist. But I think, you know, the, and unfortunately, you know, even though we do have like a little, a governor who is more recognizing that these, is, you know, these, those types of policies shouldn't be in place. The rest of our legislation here is not so supportive and recognizing of that. And I think, you know, that really did have a big piece to play because so much of like their funding and their support for the food core programs come down from you know, state universities, you know, traditionally, like state universities, like NC State, Michigan State, Iowa State, California State, those are the big ag universities that provide like a heck of a lot of support and funding, you know, to support those types of programs. And all those states, you know, still have food core. So it's kind of interesting and seeing, you know, those correlations, but Yeah, funding, unfortunately, I mean, for all programs, you know, that try to do this work and operate like a a nonprofit level, funding is like, you know, the ever struggle that we have in order to sustain and continue and support our programs. 
Yeah. I mean, another thing is North Carolina is on, uh, or part of North Carolina is in the Appalachian mountain is it not and that's a major another reason <laughs> so major I place still be there. where a lot of these food deserts and issues occur so I'm surprised that's crazy <laughs> yeah I wow. mean if like you look at like the map of North Carolina there are a lot of rural food deserts yeah. you know really like starting from Pender County going all the way west and south and north I mean you know north of us you got Carteret County um they have a lot of the same struggles as us to the southwest of us we have Columbus Robeson County which you know are socially culturally like the most diverse counties in the entire country and that's because of the number of tribes that they have there these indigenous native tribes that a lot of them don't have tribal recognition like the Lumbee so they're not able to tap into the same levels of resources and funds that the federal government distributes and you know does allow for like increased resources so you know you find we have a lot of conversations with other nonprofits and food hubs that are based in rural communities across the state and like, I honestly, you know, I live in, in a food desert myself. Um, it takes me about 18 minutes to get to the closest grocery store in Burgaw. Other than that, like my closest food access is the Sunoco gas station 10 minutes one way or a Dollar General or Johnson Corner store in, in 10 minutes in another direction. And like, I know people who live surround like who are like 10 minutes out from me and it takes them you know a half hour 45 minutes to you know get to any type of like resource access um it's you know so you know it's a really big issue I think you know talking about food deserts and food insecurity and urban and you know environments and communities is a huge, you know, conversation topic. I think it's like a real, like a big area that is needed for operations and programs. Um, but we're really not talking about our rural communities as much. Um, you know, like we saw it during COVID. I saw it during Hurricane Florence, and you know, those are like very, you know, serious, you know, natural disasters, public health disasters. I mean, it was a, it's a flipping pandemic, you know? Um, but those, you know, really just showed that like the underlying issues and that there really aren't the same levels of resource and support in these areas as people think that they probably have. I think there's like maybe the misconception, like when you live in an agrarian community and you have like a lot of producers and farmers surrounding you that it's easier for you to get affordable and healthy food. But I don't think what a lot of folks realize is that a lot of these farmers and growers, they're either very, very old at the average age of a farmer, I believe is now 67 or 68. Yeah, I was gonna say, I'm pretty sure it's like around the 60. 65 ish. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, you know, that's getting up there and it's not easy work. Or people are, you know, folks who are in their 20s, early 30s, who, you know, have tens, maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt from, you know, going to school or, you know, trying to buy a house or trying to buy a farm. And a lot of these people are living in poverty themselves. They're, you know, experiencing the same inability to access their most basic needs. Um, I mean, you know, after Hurricane Hurricane Florence, the maternity ward in Bladen County flooded and they had to shut it down and they haven't reopened it yet. So if you're having a child, you have to, usually people will come into Pender, New Hanover. And, you know, that's, if you don't have the, t- the level of health and nutritional support when, you know, you're pregnant and about to birth your child, 
that is not setting yourself or your child up for success, you know, and that's, that's the way it is right now. It's interesting that you um, mentioned kind of like the misconceptions around rural farms and because I was going to, I was going to say that because we live in a very rural area as well. And we have the differences were a high income rural area versus a low. Right. Income. So like yeah. we have a lot of farms around us. So we do have like that access, but then again, with that, it, it's like, it's just simply more expensive, like paying for the mm-hmm. organic ingredients. And so I know all the time, like we don't buy organic like locally sourced food because it just costs a lot of money but at the same time I feel kind of bad because I'm like well the like farmers are living off of like who purchases their stuff um but yeah I'm I'm glad you mentioned that because I was going to ask about that well luckily for us a lot of the local farmers um have partnerships with like big y and stuff like that so you can get a lot of local produce just at big y instead of their farm stores but it is also interesting, I found it interesting, but a different direction kind of, that you brought up the whole misconception with low income rural areas because I would suspect that a lot of the feeling or anti-government assistant type mentality comes from the neglect that they've faced for years, there's a lot of high emphasis on low income urban communities. Um, That's always been like kind of forefront of the conversation, but never really low income uh, rural communities like with the, like I talked about earlier, the Appalachians um, experience a lot of poverty, Mm -hmm. a lot, like you would be blown away. and, but there's also a lot of mistrust in government and anti-government mindset, partially because they don't have access to internet and resources. Um, and partially because of the neglect they face for years, it's like, why would I trust someone that's neglected me? So it'd be interesting to see the relationship between that uh, from a more data standpoint. I don't know if there are, is data surrounding that, but, uh, and also for people that don't know, um, because I don't know how many people are aware. So you got your Peace Corps, which uh, um, Jordan mentioned is JFK had kind of made way back when, Um, but a lot of people don't recognize that. They like to point fingers and act like we're all high and mighty and we're all well off as a nation, but a lot of locations like the Appalachia or more rural locations are just as bad, if not worse than what we deem as developing nations, which is a term I don't like to use because that those terms were used in reference to who engaged in the world war. Mm-hmm. That's a whole separate conversation of misidentification and continuous misidentification of nations and what they're deemed as. We're not gonna get into that, but um, a lot of the places that people ship off to for the Peace Corps are equivalent in a lot of ways to locations within the United States, which is why there's a thing called AmeriCorps, which is what the Food Corps is a part of. It's to address those locations within the United Mm -hmm. States, but it's not super Uh, (laughs) well-funded, like uh, Jordan touched on, but yeah, just so you guys know what that is. So for us, you'll see them often as extension leaders in your community. So I know a lot of times they'll partner with 4-H um, or universities, local universities. So for us in Connecticut, it's with UConn Extension uh, with 4-H. They have like this partnership. And so there's an extension leader there. And you usually see it in those educational farm settings that you'll see those leaders. Um, or you'll see it in, you know, places like Feast Down East, but in your community. So for us would be food share. I just remembered what it was called, Kenya. (laughs) It's food share. Um, That's who came to meet with us for our, uh, to teach us about SNAP. And so they'll do a lot of educational based things. So that's just a quick information drop for context. Uh, Semi side note, because this was way back when in the conversation, (laughs) New Zealand. Oh my God, I have wanted to go there 
for I this past couple, like this past so year or so, uh, from seeing more social media content being produced out from New Zealand surrounding sustainability and stuff like that and what they've been doing. Oh, oh. I want to go there so badly. <laughs> go. So badly. Please go. I mean, and like the my biggest regret when I went, what, and you know, I went at like my spring, summer semester and I just went for the seven weeks and came back. And I really wish I had stayed longer. Um, you, you know, in New Zealand, you can only get a visa for a year and it's really hard to get one past that. In really? order to get citizenship in New Zealand, um, you have to live there for 10 years working part time because it's such like an island nation that is so resource scarce and because they're really awesome and they, they know it and they're trying to preserve that. They know that if, you know, they make it easier for people to gain citizenship, it's going to be harder to enforce that and ensure that like, you know, the Maori aren't going to be displaced because there's not really many places that folks who live in or have, you know, in Polynesia to go. So, um, definitely go make sure that you can go for as long as you possibly can and it's actually really affordable I wasn't able to do this but it's really affordable to go to Fiji from New Zealand or Thailand so if you can really plan a trip out of it just shut up there <laughs> that sounds incredible that fits it Bella. that fits into my three-month time frame that fits into my adjusted plan I had the other day from my midlife crisis, <laughs> joining the Peace Corps instead after college, instead of going to grad school and becoming PT. I was like, I, I can't will do say this. this too. Oh. You know, I've, I've had like I haven't gone to grad school yet. I, I have my farm now, so I postponed it for another couple of years because I really wanted to focus on, you know, the growing and cultivation. Yeah, the that first we're couple of years here. are crucial. But I've had the fortune of working with a lot of grad students and folks you know who do have more acad like academia experience who never really did serve in their communities in you know one of these programs or you know work for a nonprofit or you know the department of public health someone who is like facilitating and operating them and you see like a really big disconnect between the yeah. people who have been in the field, like actually in the field, you know, operating and implementing these programs and the people who are like kind of behind the scenes, just planning, never have really been in the field, but have like a ton of research and knowledge from it at that standpoint. But every community is different. And even if you read a bunch of reports and, you know, evaluations from places within your community, you still are not having your own individual experience that allows you to empathize and understand like what people are actually experiencing. Yeah, I've been seeing uh, fairly recently within the past couple of months or so, a conversation emerging about the disconnect of, uh, within academia in terms of what they're studying and how there's that level of, well, just looking at it from an academic side and not looking at it from the literal side of life, I guess. So that's interesting that you brought that up. There's been a recent conversation about the major disconnect for studying versus experiencing, which you would think yeah. experts need to experience, study, they need to know the whole perspective, but people are starting to point that illogical standpoint out. Anyway, uh, we're getting crunched on time right now. So we're gonna jump right on into Feast Downey's specific questions. Um, first and foremost, can you explain a little bit about what Feast Down East does and is and kind of the whole Shazam? Yeah, so Feast Down East is a nonprofit based in Burgaw, North Carolina and serving surrounding communities and counties, including Wilmington, North Carolina, which is just for context for other folks, Wilmington is a small, big little city in um, North Carolina on the coast. We're about an hour and a half from the Dirty Myrtle, AKA Myrtle Beach. Um, 
Um, Myrtle Beach is a lot more like, you know, partying and touristy and Wilmington has like a really deep history in agriculture and, you know, also just a lot of areas of transportation. We're still a port city. The train, um, the railroad system headquarters actually used to be in Wilmington before they moved to Florida about a 120-ish years ago. Um, so our food hub is actually based out of a historic train depot, which is was the first train depot in the state of North Carolina. So it's, you know, back in the day, farmers would bring their products to the train depot so that they could be exported to surrounding areas. So, you know, it's really cool that we're able to be housed there because, you know, aggregation is a one of the main parts of these Downies and, you know, it's aggregation for both our farmers. So, you know, far, every week we list the, what products our farms have available and we have wholesale buyers like the local co-op, co Whole Foods, the university, University of North Carolina, Wilmington, um, well, who, the mobile market that I operate, like all like, you know, the farm to table restaurants for the most part purchase from us. So farmers are able to bring their product to this food hub, and then we're able to drive that product back into the Wilmington area and deliver it for them. So, you know, the far like farmers don't have to like have an entire like day period where they have to be off the farm and make all these deliveries. And then it also opens up, you know, other sales opportunities for, for these producers. And then on the back end, we provide like consulting services for our farm. So kind of like talking through like, you know, their, their farm, what they grow, you know, their soil levels, their labor and time commitment, crops that would work within that scheme and, you know, different um, purchasers and buyers who would be interested in acquiring that product. We have a our farmer, um, our farmer support program. So within that consulting, we also provide educational opportunities for our farmers ranging from growing hemp to food safety and handling and designing your post harvest station, you know, different types of certifications that you can get, you know, I think organic certification is like really preached and People try to exclusively buy organic, but organic isn't always better. Organic, you know, a lot of big farms who are organic are able to become organic because they have the money in order to do so. The certification and money behind becoming organic is not feasible for small to mid-sized farmers who are the farmers we work with. And organic produce and products oftentimes still support monoculture, which completely depletes the soil of its natural nutrients and doesn't allow for the land to like, you know, ecologically restore and support itself over time. So, you know, we are, we buy from conventional growers, we buy from organic growers, but then we, you know, try to educate, you know, those conventional growers, hey, like here are some, you know, alternatives that you can begin to work into your system if you choose, because, you know, we're not trying to force this on the people, but, you know, providing them with that information so they can, you know, hopefully begin to transition, transition to growing in more natural practices. Um, and then for, you know, those folks who do already grow, you know, um, without pesticides or naturally, who might be consider considering like taking out a business loan to get organic certified, like, hey, here are some other you know, ways in which you can market your product. Here are some other certified, you know, programs that you can apply for and, and you know, um, gain those certifications like certified natural, for instance, that still, you know, show and market your product to others that like, hey, you grow like ethically both for, you know, our bodies and what we're consuming, but also for the land. So we support farmers in that way. We have an emerging farmers program targeted towards producers who have less than, you know, five years of growing experience, you know, and, you know, supporting them through helping to cover the cost of internships, um, you know, sending them to different ag-based conferences for free, and just coming, kind of having like a deepened relationship and support for those people. Um, this 
past year with COVID, we also were able to launch a CSA box program. So CSAs, Community Supported Agriculture, which was created by Dr. Watley out of um, Tuscaloosa, which is Arkansas. And he was actually a black man and he was pretty much the founder of the UPIC system and CSAs. And I don't think it's shouted out enough about the incredible work that Dr. Watley did. Um, but you know, we were able to create our own CSA program and have nine to 13 different featured items um, each week where you know customers could could sign up to receive a box and then each week they would get a box of really incredible local goodness. That program was so successful post COVID that we're now continuing that like forward, which is just another opportunity for our farmers to reach consumers. And then my program is the Local Motive Mobile Farmers Market. So we reach at-risk communities. Right now, we are primarily based in the Wilmington, the urban area, but um, over the past year, I have you know, started formulating those relationships in Pender County, which is where our food hub is based, to begin reaching you know, our community members and our rural communities, because as we talked about, like that's kind of overlooked very, uh, very often. So with our mobile farmers market, 100% of our products are sourced from the same farmers that come through our food hub, you know, they, it's the same sweet potatoes and squash that you might find at the most expensive restaurant in town. We're selling that same product at our markets. The really cool thing about our market is that we accept food stamp benefits and allow for a dollar for dollar match. For a really long time, we were the only farmer's market out of about 20 that accepted food stamp benefits. Um, the downtown farmer's market, which is located there's pretty much like two food deserts that surround it that overlap into downtown, the downtown farmer's market, um, chose to stop using and accepting food stamps about seven years ago. Um, so you could, so our farmer's market in our community is oftentimes not really trying to serve every, you know, area of life, every experience and payment method. Um, we've been able to work with our only producer run market at our local co-op, Tidal Creek, the Wilmington Farmers Market. They also accept food stamps now, which is great and like super incredible and great. And they are able to offer the Fresh Bucks dollar for dollar matching program that we do as well. So we provide that resource for folks. We have um, launched a food prescription voucher program in partnership with New Hanover Regional Medical Center, which is our local hospital, and they're technically Novant now. They just went through their transition um, and sold back in February, so it's still really fresh. I'm always not too sure which one to refer to them as, either NHRMC or Novant, so I usually just say both. Um, so the food prescription program has, you know, been seeing a lot of success, even though it's super fresh. We have our community food advocate program. So we ha um, have, you know, residents and community members who are based in the neighborhoods where our markets operate. We are primarily in food deserts, but also in those neighborhoods that are surrounding food deserts, because even if you live in a food desert, that doesn't mean that you don't have safe, equitable access to healthy foods. Um, or healthcare, like a pharmacy. Um, so we try to reach a lot of those areas that experience those barriers, but in order to, you know, best ensure that we are truly representing the, that community's needs and desires, you have to truly engage with the residents of those communities and neighborhoods. And our community food advocate program has really allowed us to identify, you know, different ambassadors and leaders in those neighborhoods to, you know, help, you know, gain support and trust within these communities. Um, most of the communities that we go to in our communities of color, pretty much our entire staff is white. We recognize that, you know, that one is an issue in, you know, having equitable staffing, but also 
in you know trying to go into communities and many of these communities like have experienced some of the deepest historical systemic racism so there is a lot of mistrust and understandably so so the advocate program has really allowed us to ensure that we are engaging with the community in the way that that neighborhood would like that the resources that we're bringing into the community aren't ones that we think you know as being in a food desert that you know you need this like come that's a really crappy mentality and it's not going to be success successful unless you have that buy-in so our advocate program you know is really incredible in that sense and then those advocates you know so oftentimes these people are just kind of like yeah you're great you're an ambassador like thanks for your insight we got the information we need ta-ta we're not like that we you know really want to ensure like these are relationships a lot of our advocates are seniors right um right now and in the past and some of them are like my grandparents now i flip and love them they're the best um but they do receive like a food stipend to shop at our markets before covid we were trying to do like different farm visits um, and get them out to you know the different farms that we sell um, their product for. We have our local food conference every year, so they like receive tickets and you know get to attend that and learn more about like the local and regional food system. So you know we do a lot as a really small organization. We're a pretty mighty team. We have about ten employees. And, you know, when I launched the mobile farmers market, we only had two and a half. So we've really grown Employees. since 2018. Yeah, <laughs> it was crazy. Yeah, I was going to ask you because it's you. I was like, she just keeps naming stuff like they're doing so much. I was going to ask you how many people it takes to do this. That's crazy that it's only. 10 people like that is I could never imagine accomplishing that much with so little people but um you touched on it uh just recently so how have you seen um Feast on East expand and develop since you um joined back in 2013 24 2015 <laughs> um there yeah there's a lot of years there so I've seen the organization, you know, change and shift in so many ways. We used to have an AmeriCorps VISTA program. We used to have the Food Corps program, which, you know, the, both those programs allowed us to provide really deep community garden, school garden, and nutrition education. Those are two things, you know, that we work with like outside agencies and institutions and organizations to connect folks to garden education. Um, that's one of my side hustles. I actually um, do school garden education. I haven't been able to since pre-COVID, but um, we are able to connect them with, you know, different agencies like our local ability garden who can facilitate, you know, garden education. Um, nutrition education is still a component that, you know, we keep, we keep and have had, had housed in our programs, um, but we cross-pollinate and collaborate with different agencies like our local Smart Start. Sorry, my dog just started barking. So I was just seeing if there was anything going on out the window. Um, and the health department and extension, YWCA and YMCA and the hospital to you know deliver collaborative nutrition education because we've just found that that's the most successful believe it or not, when you work with the local community and institutions and resources you have at hand, you have a better chance of ensuring that resource and program is delivered and accessed and used. Um, so, you know, we don't really do those two things as much as, you know, we did when I came on to the org into the organization. We didn't, you know, we always have also offered levels of consulting services and education for our farmers, but not to the extent we do now through our farmer support program. Um, we used to have a CSA program like right before I came with the, into the organization. Right. So I think it was like from like 2013, 2014 to 2015, we had a CSA program, but at the time there wasn't like the level of hype and commitment to CSAs that 
there is now. So we actually, you know, didn't, that program was like costing us money, which as a nonprofit, you can't, can't really like, you know, that's kind of an issue. Um, so we, you know, ceased that program, but now, you know, that's one of our most successful programs. It's insane. It's so cool. I love it. Um, and you know, we didn't have a mobile market. We did like a little roadside market stand, but you know, we operate now out of a refrigerated vehicle. But when I started doing, you know, our roadside stand markets, I was operating out of my little Subaru Outback. Um, so by doing like having a refrigerated vehicle, we're able to reach so many more communities than, you know, the one or two that we were back then. So, you know, we've really seen the organization develop over time based on, you know, the com what the community says, you know, the organization was grassroots. We started by just pulling in farmers and extension agents and, you know, foodies and business owners who wanted to support local food and people who like lived in housing authority communities and just had like round table, you know, focus group talking sessions for a really long time. And this was like back in 2006. And that's something that, you know, we've continued over, oh my gosh, it's like 15 years. I feel old. Um, <laughs> it's something that no, we've continued. And I think that's allowed like our programs to evolve and shift based off of, you know, just the current state of things. Yeah, I think you brought up a pretty good point for people who are listening and kind of looking to get into things. Um, timing and listening is key when you're dealing with communities because a lot of times, and this is a conversation I saw probably on Twitter, like a long Twitter thread <laughs> about, uh, I know earlier we talked about the disconnect between academia and uh, what they're studying. And recently I've been seeing also a conversation alongside that about the disconnect between nonprofit work and the communities they serve uh, and how a lot of times this can develop because a lot of times with nonprofits we deal with a lot of um, underserved communities which happen to be a lot of low income POCs uh, which deals with a lot of trauma and mistrust um, and how there's a lot of times this white savior complex type thing going in um, which is just not a good relationship to have and which is why uh, there's a lot of conversation surrounding it, rightfully so. Um, but it's important to recognize uh, if you're looking into something like this, uh, timing and listening is everything when you're dealing with communities that are not the same from where you grow up or your perspective is. Listening, checking in, having people from those communities on uh, positions of authority within your organization, whether it be uh, to consistently give you input or to serve on a board type level. Either way, it's important to have that. You need to be in tune. Uh, you need to have that kind of grassroots mentality. You can't go in with a, I'm better and I'm here to save you mentality because the, uh, and this was taught to us by DC Central Kitchen, or not taught to us, but really honed in your goal as a nonprofit is to not have to exist. You don't want to be there to co be a dependent or for that codependency to be there. Your goal is to not exist. And so your goal is to go in there and help where needed and listen and adjust with what your community needs. Um, and so you brought up another thing, timing. You, when you're talking about your success and the development through uh, as your organization has changed over the years and kind of this didn't work at that time, that's fine. Later on, you see that knee start to develop, you bring that back again, that program back. And so be adjusting, recognize that you don't need to have this constant program going forever. You may need to change it, discontinue it, restart it. That's totally fine. That's part of what nonprofit stuff does. You need to be malleable. We talk about this a lot and don't be disconnected. Don't go in with the I'm better than you mindset because that feeds into the mistrust, uh, whether it be in those low rural, uh, low income rural communities or in those urban uh, POC predominant communities. Um, so just listen. Uh, another thing you kind of talked about, which I'm not gonna go into too much depth because I can go on easy rants about this, is the conversation surrounding organic produce. That, yes. 
everyone, there's been a big push and a lot of it has to do with consumer semi-propaganda type uh, mindset in terms of how can I get people to pay more for products that are not entirely better, but, you know, than what is being offered right now. And the whole push to misinform the public and pay more and upcharge. Um, yeah, sometimes it's not, it's not a feasible thing for your local farmer. Uh, recognize that a lot of farmers, and this is across the board, this goes for large farms to low far, uh, to middle, low um, uh, size farms. A lot of them are themselves on SNAP and themselves cannot, can barely afford their mortgages and things like that. So to, as a consumer, continue to push these practices that, like you said, are very mono uh, crop type situations, which destroys our topsoil and other things, um, <laughs> recognize the implications that it can have. Uh, maybe look for other outlets and dive into it. That doesn't mean don't buy organic, buy whatever you want, buy whatever's on sale, you know? Um, but just look into it and recognize where biases can occur and why that mindset may have been pushed onto you in the first place. Mm -hmm. So that's a quick little, that's like probably the smallest rant I'll ever go on in that topic. <laughs> but yeah. I'm impressed. I'm impressed and I'm proud because it's yeah. a hard one to not rant on. I have gone. Um, I'm really <laughs> I don't like I my friends will like pull me back when we're out in the well before COVID um when we would like be out and about talking about things you know at the bar to people and they'd like pull me and they'd be like Jordan no no don't do this like, don't do this <laughs> yeah. they're so used to it I'm really glad you brought up DC Central Kitchen um you know, they have World Central Kitchen when they respond to disasters. Yeah. And Jose and his team actually came here during Hurricane Florence. Um, and I, I was here then. I, our refrigerated vehicle, I actually got, it was a whole saga behind getting it. It took about nine months, but I got it the week before the hurricane. And it was like the biggest oh, blessing timing, of all time yeah. because it allowed us to do an incredible amount of relief work. Like I was the first person to come into the county I'm in with resources um, outside of a church who was here. Um, and it was all because of that vehicle. But I was able at that time too to bring meals from World Central Kitchen. And we were able to take, you know, the meals that they were preparing at different commissary kitchens by some you know, of our local chefs and bring them into these communities who like weren't able to, they, they still did that some of these communities didn't have electricity for almost two weeks. One of them was like a senior housing high rise. So it's made for seniors and disabilities. Like you can only live there if you're a senior or disabled and didn't have power. Some people are on the third floor cutting it down. So they needed food. So we were able to you know reach them and it's actually what our new food bank site, we have a 250 person commercial kitchen. And part of that we actually wrote in with World Central Kitchen and Jose with the understanding that, you know, with the way the climate has been, like we've had um, five name storms in 26 years here. And, you know, a name storm is like a 100, 500 or thousand year flood. So we've had those level of floods, like um, Florence was a 1,000 year flood, so was Floyd. Matthew was a 500 year flood, so was Fran. Shouldn't be having a historic 500, 1,000 year flood every eight years. That's kind of a problem. So there is like, you know, the understanding that there is going to be increases in our storms and with that, you know, people who are able to access food. So World Central Kitchen and the Food Bank of Central and Southeastern North Carolina kind of teamed up to, you know, build a space where when there are, you know, instances of disaster like that, we're able to come in and, you know, serve the community. And I believe the way the grant, like the program and like the equipment was written, they'll 
will be able to serve 10,000 meals a day, like cook and serve out 10,000 meals a day in a time semester. So it's really cool that you guys have like been able to talk with DC Central Kitchen a little bit more. Um, I love that. Yeah, and for anybody that wants to get into food justice or interested to learn a little more, DC Central Kitchen and uh, they're just a really good resource to get to know things. They have a lot of connections to a lot of different organizations across the country. They happen to have a connection, which we didn't know about, <laughs> to Feast Down East, which is really cool. Um, uh, they're really involved outside of DC, within DC. A lot of their programs are really cool. Um, but if you look more into uh, different things, the further you get into them, you'll learn a plethora of knowledge surrounding the topic. Um, Another uh, situation uh, that I thought of, because um, I didn't know you guys have been having these like historic floods, um, with historic floods outside of the fact that you're not getting, uh, there's an issue with access to food. There's an, ex uh, also creates an issue of distribution and production of food. Uh, floods, a lot of times, especially with that topsoil, which is crucial. Um, can absolutely wreck the land that uh, these farms in these rural areas reside on. And with that, uh, they can negatively impact production of food and your crops. Um, but that also gets into climate change, that gets into the issue of just photosynthesis at, in general with modern day plants and how it's not you know, up to par with how production of CO2 and all that is going. That's gets into more science, technical aspects, which we'll, we won't jump in right now on, but if you're interested in learning more about it, search up like photosynthesis and rubisco in terms of plants and productivity and, uh, of that, because yeah, I won't give you more into that because that can get real science and technically, technically. <laughs> technically that's not even a word uh real quick but uh just some little food for thought no pun intended did I... <laughs> okay food for thought oh okay i didn't care. oh my if i have to keep explaining every single one of my puns to you kenya half of them just aren't good which is that was good oh did my you God. say food for thought yes Oh, well, I missed it. Anyway, that'll be my food incorporation for today, folks. Um, <laughs> uh, um, yeah, can you? Uh, so do you have any final words? <laughs> um, I feel like we could all talk about all these things for days. It's really incredible when you find, you know, folks out there who are getting the word out like y'all are and you know just the passion behind it and the understanding like you know the stepping back and actually listening before engaging and implementing it's just it's really great when you hear other people you know talk about that and recognize it and you know kind of preach by it um you know preach work that y'all do and you know just for final plugs for feast down east um our website is feast f-e-a-s-t down d-o-w-n east e-a-s-t e-a-s-t dot org i can spell um and if you go to our blog which you can find on our website you know we publish like different recipes we have a virtual nutrition education program on there we do features on different farms and seasonal and local produce and partner relationships we have. If, you know, you kind of want to learn a little bit more about like what we do as an organization. We're on Facebook and the gram um, at Feast Down East or, or yeah, it's just at Feast Down East. Wow. Okay. Um, and if you're like interested in following our, along on my husband and I's farm journey, our farm is called Green Sky. Um, farms green sky just like it sounds and we're on instagram and facebook as well awesome thank you so much um and so the inspirational quote for the day um i would love to get your perspective on it a little bit 
um, is actually by Dwight Eisenhower, which I did not expect. I mean, maybe I just don't know his history. I don't know. But um, <laughs> the quote is, every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired signifies in the final sense, a theft from those who hunger are not fed, whose hunger is not fed, those who are cold and not clothed. Sorry, I said that kind of wrong. <laughs> but <laughs> basically, to me, um, I read it and I just thought, um, and I was talking with my family about this, just kind of the um, democracy mentality that we live in that me, 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 and to not worry about anyone else. Um, and you mean the my mom said, society. What'd you say? The capitalistic society, not the, the yes. Not the Thank you for that correction. Yeah. Thank you. The capitalistic society, um, and to pull yourself up by your own boot shops. And my mom said, but what if some people just have souls? And I said kind of jokingly, but sadly it is too often a reality. Like they need to get their own boots then. Like that's just the reality. Um, but yeah, that's just kind of how I thought of this quote. I'm so lost. I haven't heard that quote before. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. No, I mean, awesome. I definitely think too, like it signifies that like we as like a globalized country resort so much to technological machinery, violence and trying to, you know, fight for our freedom and our rights. And, you know, we focus so much on that, that we're not actually focusing on the things that people need in order for them to be successful and have the same freedom and choice that we do. Yeah, like advances over humanity kind of, which is desperately needs to change, but yeah. Fighting violence with violence gets you nowhere. <laughs> Awesome. Um, or paraphrase it rather. <laughs> right. <laughs> Go on. Good job. Um, thank you so much, Jordan. Um, I wish we could talk for hours. Um, and yes, um, everyone definitely go and follow Feast Down East. All of the incredible, they're doing so much work. Oh my goodness. Um, and if you ever get a chance to visit North Carolina or New Zealand, um, Go do it. <laughs> YOLO. <laughs> Why not? Why not? YOLO. Treat yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And thank you for doing the good work that y'all do. Appreciate you. Ditto. I hope your farm flourishes <laughs> this year. <laughs> And everything works out with COVID. And Thank all. you. Because <laughs> I know it's been difficult. Oh, it's so, yeah, no, it's COVID was kind of a blessing for us because since we had to work from home, we kind of expedited our three year plan into three months. So nice. um, I'm actually eagerly awaiting my first goat to have her kids um, like any second now. That's why I keep looking out my window because I'm like uh, monitoring her. Um, but yeah. Goat picks. So yep. that's why I follow my gram and you'll see baby goats and baby piglets. They're really cute and plants. Alrighty now. You can find us at our website at www.nourishmysoul.org. All under Coe's. Uh, you can find us on Facebook and YouTube. Just search Nourish My Soul. You can also find us on Instagram. You can find our parent organization, which is Nourish My Soul, at nourish.my.soul. Or you can find our teen group from the ground up at from without the O, ground up. You can email our founder, Alicia, at alicia, spell A-L-I-C-I-A, at nourishmysoul.org. And you can, of course, listen to us on YouTube, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Anchor, Breaker, Podcast, and Radio Public. Peace out, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, and Non-Binary Scouts. I hope you liked this recording and have a fabulous day.